from a town where most of the people are so close minded They go into school and they work in a job but they don't even like it I won't be put in a box, nobody telling me what I should rock Nobody telling me what I should drop cause I do what I want and just nobody don't stop Recording till 4 in the morning, they snoring the off. They sent out surveys to you guys um, and there were two. I think there was one that's directly from mine that I asked them to send out where I asked a couple questions. A couple of those questions revolved around your why in the form of your core focus of your business, your what in the, the term of your purpose, cause, or passion, why the business exists, what you'll do better than anybody else in there. And I got a handful of answers. Some I got down in here, we're gonna discuss them. I don't have names associated with them. It's gonna be completely anonymous. But I want some more and I just called out individuals I didn't have answers from. I'm literally, T and Tony from Team Breakaway. Why does your business, Team Takedown, I apologize. Why does your business exist? Uh, our business is, uh, it's, a, it's a 501c3. I think that our organization, where we're at right now, has a lot of uh, under, under uh, kids, a lot of migrant workers. So you're a nonprofit? Right. Amazing. So um, the, the area there is just, I mean, it's, where I was ready to go poor, so okay. without being able to afford, uh, open up the gym to be able to have kids come in and do things without having to be able to pay. Um, and Help kids who can't afford fitness. Right. Perfect. Right, right. Phenomenal. Let's go. Kelsey and Ben, CrossFit, when Atachi, when Tachi? That was close. That was the. That was close. If you say that, let's say it, when Atchi. When Atchi. <laughs> when Tachi, when Atchi. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I answered. So repeat them for me. Why does this business exist? Oh boy. Let me get my list out. So our whole goal, we both work in somewhat of a service line industry. Okay. I'm a nurse, she's a firefighter. We see a lot of chronic conditions, a lot of chronic illnesses on the end side of it. Um, that, you know, med medicine, I think everyone can be pretty frustrated with medicine these days. Like we just kind of treat chronic illness symptoms. We don't treat the actual disease processes anymore. So we wanted to present something to uh, our community that would help them kind of get out of some of their chronic conditions, that would remind people that they can move. Like we always tease, we help people survive the apocalypse. So like if you can think of all the things you would need to be able to do to, to survive the apocalypse, those are things you should be able to do and most people can't do them today. Um, and that's kind of like our overarching goal. Cool. Um, we see a lot of service line industry people have poor outcomes once they retire or while, while they're in the service line. In the service line industry, what I mean is firefighters, law enforcement officers, military, DMS, uh, people that work, shift work in healthcare tend to be some of our most out of shape and chronically ill people that we have out there and it should be the opposite. Yep. So we, we try to give them an uh, avenue to be able to come back and find their life of fitness. Yeah. Their ability to we don't want fat cops and firefighters. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Let's go ahead and let me get CrossFit PE, Lori Fish. Where are we at? Awesome. Lori, what is your business going to do better than anybody else? in your market, in your area, whether it's remotely, regionally, whatever it is, what will your business do better? What is the thing you're gonna to try to do better than everybody else? Um, I think people are getting stuck in this model of like we just offer CrossFit and that's it. Um, and whether we kind of have this little ego about it and say, but this is the best way. Like some people just don't wanna do it. And that's fine. Like we should look at making them healthier. So if that means doing a barbell less class or doing yoga, a masters, a kid, whatever, like. So your what will be diversifying the things you offer? Yeah, I'm just not being snotty about class. Okay. Very cool. Alrighty, let me get. Aurora, is it uh, Dan Leo? Dan Lau? Sorry, Leo. I'm fucking retarded. Dan, what will your business do better? And it is Akuro? Akuo. 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 Uh, what will it do better than anyone else? Uh, we, uh, everybody says what makes them uh, different is coaches, programming, and community. Um, Did you read my speech beforehand? That's so good. Never, just joking. Keep going. I think every gym does that uh, as well as they think. Um, and uh, I think we will. We, we really strive to be authentic and try and pursue those three things. Um, and then um, community is really our reality. Okay, so coaching, community, programming? Yes. Cool. Dan, you're going to like this. All right.
Very good. Anyone have one that like that they want to just share for the purpose of this? I might have it if you already filled it out or maybe I didn't call you out, but does anyone have a what or why? Why you do, why does your business exist or what you're going to do better than anyone that they want to just share? I could add to this list. We're going to come back to this. And by the way, those of you guys I just called out, that's not easy to do on the spot. Thank you so much. Adam. Uh, Adam, Spokane, CrossFit Rewired. Uh, I think we do relationships better than anybody in town. Um, that was kind of our goal from the get-go, and as the market's grown, we've got a lot of competitors that don't do that well, and it's really just kind of confirmed our identity and our, our perceptive member sees that initially. Our members that have been around for a long time know it, love it, so no plans in changing that. Relationships. Cool. All right, you guys. Let's get into this. Yeah. So um, it's one of the models that we use, but we say that we're creating champions in life because we deal with kids. Okay. And so they have to learn on, they learn physical, um, nutrition, and work. Love it. Love it. Can you say that one more time? Champion, what was that? Champions in life, creating champions in life. <clears throat> I'd wear a fucking shirt that said that. That's, no, that's great. That's really dialed in. All right, let's beam this up. All righty. We're going to come back to all that here in a second. All righty. So uh, going back to this, I want to talk to you about not you necessarily, but for a lot of you guys, you are the essence of the business. I want to talk to you about business exists, and I'm going to try to not mess this up for you guys. And what will you do better than anyone in the area? Now, when we get into this whole thing, I want you guys thinking of your core values as these Behavioral traits that cannot be contrived. They're real. You can't make them up. Now, we can have aspirational ones. I have one aspirational core value, and I'm going I'm to list mine out in some other businesses. I'm going to use me as an example up here today. One of my uh, aspirational core values is one that we're not, we don't always exemplify. I don't think we've done a great job with it. Going forward, it's something we want to be doing. So you can have core values as we identify them with your business that are honestly not being rocked out right now, but they are things you are working towards. The majority of your core values when we identify them should be something that you recognize in your business. Your members would recognize it. Punctuality. The gym that literally has had a zero days where anyone showed up late to open up the 5 a.m. class. Anyone here be late or no show on an early morning class in the early days, right? It's happened. Maybe if the gym owner literally, they're one of those people that's just nitpicky about punctuality. They never let that happen, right? Again, your core values will bleed through this whole thing. Well, well ideally, I'd like for you guys to identify three to seven. Um, and these could be exemplified by not only yourself, if you, you know, are the main person, but if you have employees, you have a head coach who has been with you for a few years and their personality and who they are has bled into the business by osmosis. It's now transferring out to everybody else. When you're making this list and you're sitting down, it's difficult. You'll write a bunch of things down. We're honest. We're punctual. We're funny. We care. Blah, blah, blah. You're going to kill, keep, and combine. This list, like if you sat down and we just shut, you know, shut everything down right now and everyone took 45 minutes to do this, you'd have 20 words on a piece of paper. Kill, keep, and combine. Come down to about three to seven that are going to be your core values. This is an exercise that doesn't happen in one 30-minute session. This is something that could take you weeks, months, whatever it may be. Now, core values, and here's just three examples, right? I use myself as one, Cliff Bar, and Soul Cycle. I'll let you guys just kind of read them. I'm not going to go all the way through them. These are things, I know mine probably took a total of nine hours locked in a room with my leadership team after everyone read Traction twice and had to get on and Google definitions because we didn't know what things meant. These are mine. They could, change and they could change at some point, but odds are this is pretty much their core setup. We went through probably, I think, 46 initial ones to come up with those. The first two were inspired by Glassman, if you've ever heard that talk, be endearing and enduring. Right? Look at Cliff Bar, the things that they identify with, Soul Cycle, the things that they identify with. There's no right or wrong core values. It doesn't matter. And I picked these three because they're all kind of different. Your core values for your company will not be judged. You pick them just as long as we live by them. We'll talk about hiring by them, evaluating employees by them, making operational decisions by them. <clears throat> now, core values, a lot of times we think slogans. 
right? We think the, the like that little champions thing there, like that that is a great quip that I could you know I could put up in my office. I could have on a mug. We could sell on sweatshirts. Those those reminders every day, putting it places for people to see, repeating it, having it in your signature of your email. That's all great. The reminders. That is not how you create a company culture based on your core values. My general manager, nine years in, that would mean she was client number 002 or one, whatever it was. I truly believe the reason we have such a long riding history together is even when we didn't know what the fuck core values were, we didn't like live by them, it was early on, it was happening automatically. It was already, it was there. And we understood that. And our personalities, because she was there full time with me in the co pilot seat, blended to create the company. And now we look back on it, we're like, oh, well, that's why we do these things, because we're like this. Those ideas and the things we've done bleed through in everything that we do. And I'm gonna go over, there's three key actions that you guys are gonna take with these core values to make sure that that bleeds through the company, okay? But the one thing I'm gonna say down here, consistency and discipline. If a core value is like punctuality, and you have a coach that shows up late for class once every six weeks, you either need to, again, determine your HR standing with that individual based on your core values by relieving them. Or you need to sit back and be like, fuck, we're keeping them and we're not gonna be on time all the time. So maybe that's not a core value. And it's something we actually don't embody. It's an aspirational one. But I want you guys to be thinking consistency and discipline are the only things that make like, every, you guys are all gonna be like core value and business and rah, 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 fucking like after you leave here this weekend. It's gonna be fresh, it's hot in you. Six months from now, are you still gonna be doing all the shit that you're gonna be wanting to put in action the second you walk out of here? All right, consistency and discipline. So number one, we hire every single employee based on the core values. You guys saw the five I listed there for Urban Movement. That is literally the initial hiring process. I've got a level, shut the fuck up, I don't care. I don't care what certification you have. I went to school, I don't care. I 100% hire on the, uh, the person we develop the skill. Raise your hand if you had a different profession before becoming a coach. Like you went to school or you had, you had a trade or a skill set and you had a job other than coaching. Holy shit, yep. Guess what, you're a professional coach now to the point that you opened a fucking brick and mortar. So why in the world are you sitting there like, mm, he doesn't have his level three, I don't know if he's gonna be a good fit here. Who the fuck were you when you got a level one? Seriously, what did you know? You can't teach someone to not be a jerk. You can't teach someone to make Sally, who's the only black woman in an all-white class, feel less anxious. You can't show me a progression to make people laugh at 5.30 in the morning. People either have it or they don't. You can teach anyone how to coach a fucking squat. I'm not trying to downplay the ability of our coaches. What I am trying to say is I think a lot of times we look to hire on skill, experience. I want them to have this. A lot of times the stuff we're looking for, we don't even have as gym owners because we just made that flip into this arena recently. We had a completely different profession. So hire every single employee based on core values and do it where you're almost trying to talk them out of the job. So down here. So Dale, listen, every single coach that works at Urban Movement is constantly in a customer first mentality because in, be endearing is one of our core values, right? Each coach sends personalized text. We don't stand around on our phones after the workouts like my coaches. After workout's done, they help unload weights, they help put away equipment, they are still there. We have a customer first mentality and that is one of the logistical things we do in my business to show that every day to the client. Now Dale, listen, if this is one of these things that doesn't sound like it's gonna fit with you, this probably isn't a good job for you. And maybe Dale sits back and you can see kind of the energy draining out of him and he's like, fuck, I don't, I don't wanna talk to people after class. Maybe he's not a good fit. Or maybe he comes back and be like, Actually, that's, that's phenomenal. The last job I had when I was working at the restaurant, I literally loved, like I would always write personalized notes on the bill, and if I talked with the customer and I found out they had a daughter, I'd always leave a nice note. You know, you know, tell your daughter, I said, good luck at her soccer game. I'm like, fuck, this guy's gonna be a perfect fit. He already gets that customer first mentality. I'll hire him on the spot. I don't care what he's got coaching-wise. I can teach it. Hire based on the core values, and I promise you, your turnover, no one's ever turned over a coach. He just can't teach the squat, uh, the squat real good. He just sucks at coaching the squat. It's rarely ever that. It's rarely ever that. It's always something else. Number two, performance reviews with every single employee based on core values. You guys already have employees. So what do you do with them? 
we start, we'll talk about explaining our core values to them, making sure they understand what they are, what we expect, and then our performance reviews are around that. Are you still going to review them on whether they, you know, they wrote that progression on time for the client's individual design? Yes. Are you still going to you know, judge them whether they're clocking in, clocking out? Those logistics and things, absolutely. But the key here is these are the hard talks. Anyone have an employee present or past where it wasn't the coaching that was the problem, it was the attitude? Raise your hand if you've had an attitude problem. Like, the dude's good on the floor. He just doesn't give a fuck, and everyone knows it. This is what I'm talking about. But how can you, there's not a metric for not giving a fuck. It's not like you ran class 10 minutes over. Those are minutes, that's a metric. There's no metric for that other one. So when you've talked with people about this, they know what the core values are, and you're able to give them examples of how they are or are not exemplifying them, you can have a hard conversation. Being positive. Dale, as you know, being positive is one of our core values. It's the most important characteristic we exemplify here. Yes, we work long hours. I know you're hangry. I know you had to coach three classes back to back. But when you're in here, your attitude is everything. And it's obvious. You are not that good of a poker player. You cannot bluff those members. They know you're fucking miserable when you look miserable. Here's what I want to talk about last Sunday in class. And you give an example. Maybe a client came up and said something to me, Dale. So this is why I'm having a conversation with you. Having hard conversations around core values is more difficult than it is you showed up late to class. But these are the things I promise you. You want clients coming back into the doors month after month and earning their business? This is the shit that you hammer down with your employees. Their snatch progression, you can fix that. Having a quarterly state of the company or state of the union meeting. This is something we'll get into a little bit deeper. And if I'm blocking you guys at any point, just yell at me. Um, this is going to be similar, very simple. Where you've been, where you are now, where you are going. We'll give live examples of employees in the business, how they've embodied these core values. Like literally, you're going to have a meeting and talk about this. And I'm going to get into it deeper. I just want to make sure to finish this third point. I had one recently. If you follow my shit, you know that we did this rebranding. We bought this new building. We completely changed our model. Right? I had this conversation with the staff, and I had to let them know, what it is we were doing, why it is we were doing it, and what the plan is going forward. That was a tough conversation. It was a lot easier to, to give and for people to digest and say, hey, I'd like to be a part of that, or it's not for me, when I based everything around the why being these core values, because this is who we are going forward. It made the decisions, it made a lot more, well, why are you doing that? Well, because we're doing this. It made a lot more decisions. It wasn't a monetary thing, it wasn't, it wasn't a metric tied to it, outside of the core values. These things, and again, I'm going to get back to this quarterly state of the, uh, the union meeting that you'll have with your staff, but identifying the core values, guys, I cannot, it's such a fluff piece. If you would have came to me in 2010 when I started my business, I would have told you, like, I'm leave, whatever, dude, I got a coach class. But I'm telling you, it is this shit like that. You won't find really successful companies walking around that couldn't identify, and they might not use those terms, core values, they might have mission statement, they might have whatever they call it. You will not find any successful companies that could not sit down and have a very intelligent, in-depth conversation about what, who, like as if their business was a person. Any of you guys who attended uh, my spring training, I just grilled into you for two days that your business is like a person. It's a separate entity. You are not the business. It has its own thing, its own who, its own what. Now, the why is my favorite part. This why is two elements that like we talked about. Why your business exists, purpose, cause, or passion, and then what you'll do better than anyone else. This is the most important to me because this is the one that determines the storytelling we do to everybody. Prospects, current members, everybody. This is the marketing. This is what everyone's trying to figure out. Like, how in a digital thumb scroll world can I could grab your attention and make you come here? This is so important. This is the marketing message. So pay attention here. Save questions to the end. But as we continue, well, depending on your business aspirations, I truly don't believe you'll ever do anything relative in the micro gym world unless you have these things dialed in. For right now, you're like, I'm doing really well, and I don't know any of that stuff still. I'm like, just wait. Just wait. Everyone set your, put his zip code in your Craigslist at, you know, app. He'll be done. Set your expectations. If you're doing well already, Change this a little as you guys go through this and think about, okay, what have I been doing? Like, go back, reverse engineer, what's been made me so successful? I don't expect everyone to have gone through this stuff. I hadn't gone through this stuff until a couple years ago. Now, these traction meetings, if you go deep into that book, I highly recommend 
you'll get into what's your team versus your leadership team. You have meetings based on this. And I don't care if you read the book or not, if you meet with your team once a week, every other week, about on your core values, are we staying on path with all that? What are examples where we deviated? What are examples we nailed it? God, I promise you, there's monetary metrics to come favorably. It's just a direct consequence. Now, why you exist. Um, what excites you to get up in the morning? Like the nonprofit, I'm so glad I called you guys out. That's, that's so unique. Anyone else have a, anyone else a nonprofit 501c3? Phenomenal. So cool. Um, what excites you to get up in the morning? Right? What is the organization's reason for existence? Now, a couple things, it's gotta come from the leader. Generally, again, we're all starting these off ourselves. You have got to eat, sleep, and breathe it. It can't be something like, I saw someone put this up on Instagram. That looks kinda of motivational and cool. <laughs> yeah, we'll do that one. It's got to come from you. It's actually gotta be here, because if it's not, you guys know. You, a lot of you guys had jobs prior. It wasn't in you. You didn't want it, you fucking left it to do this thing. So it has to be within you. You have to eat, sleep, breathe, just believe in it fully. Beyond money. We're all here to make money, but it has to go beyond that. Because I promise you, when, it's, when the times get tough and it looks like maybe I'm not gonna make as much money doing this thing that I truly believe in, that's what's gonna keep pushing you forward. It ignites passion and it, it's an actual purpose, meaning people don't lead, purposes do. And as an example, you know, I mean, to, to use in the room, when I, when I hear James Fitzgerald's name, I associate myself with coaching education and the drive of individual coaching design for a better business. But a lot of you guys might not, you might just know it as OPEX. Like I identify with an individual, but even if I never met James or I didn't know of him back in 2005, I could get down with that purpose. Purposes is what people buy into. There might be a, you know, a bat signal that that's that one person that you identify with, but it's the purpose of the business, the mission, what you're trying to accomplish. That is what not only your staff, but your clients will buy into. Not you. Not you necessarily. You might be the figurehead for a period of time. But it won't be you. That won't be the main thing. Um, if you guys never read um, Selling the Invisible by Beckwith, do that shit. Um, dictating the time to sit down with your leadership team. These meetings are so stupid. Like, okay, that redhead said I got to sit down with you. We got to talk about who we are as people and what values. And you'll stare at your head coach or whatever and you guys will come up with nothing and you're literally going to be there and be like this was a fucking waste of time. I promise you it's uncomfortable. It is hard. It takes hours of feeling like you're wasting time. We should be doing something else, following up with leads. This is shit that is so important. I cannot recommend to not do it outside the gym. Like leave the business. Go on a vacation. Take a staycation. Get a hotel room and just lock yourself in there. Be completely isolated from people who are going to distract you. Now, once we know why the business exists, and you know, the one thing I want you to realize is your why should be, shouldn't let me know you're in fitness. Not yet, that's gonna be your niche, okay? Your why should be completely agnostic, take it to any market, very easy and simple, very elevator pitch, right? Three to seven words, a simple language, big and bold, and it has that, ah, that aha effect, it makes sense. Like, oh, well, I get that. We're gonna talk about it a little bit here. Um, and when we establish our core focus, this is the one thing I really like for it, and I use the term and maybe this is less familiar, shiny ball syndrome. Does anyone know what I mean if you have shiny ball syndrome? Like, okay, you get distracted by shit easily like a cat, okay? That is the one thing I like about when you really have a laser dialed in core focus. Distractions are less attractive to you because you're like, oh yeah, but that's not our shit, we're doing this. That looks good, that looks fun, that looks profitable, but that's not what we do. A lot of us fall into that trap, a lot of us. Down here, if your why was creating the most unique fitness experience, personalized to each person, but then you fucking, you had a couple bad months, you shit the bed and panic, and you're like, oh God, six week challenge. Did you lose your why? I think so. It's not a bad thing, people lose their why all the time, they get back on path, but if your why was something like this, you're like, okay, Stu, we locked ourselves over at the Hampton Inn for seven hours, we figured it out, we've been working on it, we've been developing it, we're all about it. Shit, fourth quarter 2018 was rough. Honey, dial up on those six-week challenges, get them. And this was your core focus, your why? Yeah, my opinion, you went off track. You should have stayed the course. You'll persevere. So think about that when you guys are dialing your why. What are you doing that's taking you off track? And if you got off track, that's okay, we all do. 
get back on track. So these are examples of why that you guys gave to me in the survey. These are examples that we just asked around here to create happy, healthy, involved community, enhance people's lives through community and fitness. Community, I know it's redundant, but we do it. Health and balance through fitness to enhance our community, to help uh, people become hashtag every day better, to forge a stronger community, to help clients feel better about themselves and overall health. Nonprofit, that was you guys, creating champions for life, and present a solution to chronic illness in our community, especially for the service personnel. These are a lot of the whys that we have. Cool. I'm good with, like, again, there's no such thing as a right or wrong why. I want to help probably dial some of this in for you guys. Here's some other examples. That's my why. Inspire movement. Disney wants to make people happy. Nike, bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. Alchemy 365, which is connected to the fine people at Torpedo back there. Help people feel alive. Soul cycle, bring soul to the people. Again, you can agree with it, disagree with it, it doesn't matter, that is their why. Right, wrong, or whatever. These are the whys. Now, Once we've established your why, you've written it down, it's simple, three to seven letters, big and bold, aha effect, you all agree with it, you're eight hours in the hotel room kind of cramming on this thing. We're gonna go ahead and figure out our niche, which is the one thing you will do better than anybody. All right, it should be simple, it should be overly complicated, it should be something that is the superior skill that you bring to the market. I believe every business should have three uniques, your competitors will have two of your three, they should probably not have all three. Your goal is for them to not have all three. What are you truly great at and enjoy doing that will help you figure out your niche? Going back to what is it that wakes you up every day with the hairs on your arms, you get excited and jazzed up. There is something that when you have put in a 17 hour day that one thing happens in your gym and you literally feel like you just woke up. You feel fucking me. It could be that client's PR. It could be something where someone walks up and they've got a tear in their eye and they're showing you their body fat percentage test they just got done and it's down to 12%. And that's like that thing for them that just, ugh, that's why they're here, that's why you do what you do. Whatever that thing is, dial that thing in. Like, even just talking about it gets me, just, whatever your why is, all right? Now, out of that why, what do you do better than everybody else? Something specific to your sector. If you were a female who had three children and then you decided to say, fuck corporate world, I'm gonna open a gym, and your specialty is pre and postnatal training, and you have an on-site daycare, you work with women and your thing is helping women through their journey, wherever they are, whether they're contemplating, currently pregnant, or post. That would be a specific sector that you have dialed in and gone and studied and you've niched down into, okay? Now, establish your niche is difficult because it forces you to start saying no, right? The rock climbing gym, we're gonna be the best rock climbing gym in Seattle. So I was like, man, I, I know a lot of people like doing TRX. Should we set one of those up? Well, fuck yeah, bring it in. No, we're a rock climbing gym. We're gonna be the best rock climbing gym. Yeah, but TRX, I like yellow. <laughs> like, no, it doesn't support our why and the what we're gonna do better than everybody else. How many of you guys in the past, what's it probably been, 18 months, 24 months, have put in heart rate monitor tracking into your gym via Wattify or whatever the fuck those things are? Cool, it's good, awesome. How many of you 36 months prior, if I would have brought that to you, might have told me that's a dumb idea, might not have considered doing it? But then you went ahead and you're like, what, Orange Theory, what are they doing? Oh, yeah, no, get some of that shit, let's go. <laughs> I want to be the best CrossFit gym in blank city. But what, what are those guys doing? I don't know, he just got a nice car. Whatever he's doing, get by his shit. So again, that's, that's a big one. I'm all for the heart rate trial. I'm a data guy. So I'm not saying that's a good thing about it. It's just an example that I knew would be relative in this room. Now, your niche. It's gotta be something that you own, that you can control, and it's not entirely subjective to opinion. Everything is subjective to opinion, right? These statements here, I'm gonna, I'm, this is where you know, a little conflict, a little friction, and a little discomfort today is I'm gonna kick this thing off. These statements here, in my opinion, you cannot wrap your brand, your business's niche around these things. So I said, Dan, you and me are gonna have a good conversation today. This is, in my opinion, features, elements of what you do, 
It is not the thing you were going to do better than anyone. Now, it could. We're going to talk about this. But these three things, community and coaching. I truly believe for you, and I'm going to literally make this kind of a statement because this is the type of delivery I do, but I do it to get this conversation kicked off. Nobody gives a fuck. They do, but for your purpose, I want to peel back a layer and tell you it doesn't so we can have a conversation. And the conversation we're gonna to have today around these three items is gonna hopefully have you guys dig in and realize, yes, you have amazing community. Yes, your programming is phenomenal. It's maybe tailored to every person or it's perfect for group or whatever it may be. Your coaching is top notch. But hopefully you guys walk out of here with at least some idea, you jotted something down, you put that shit in your pocket and six months later you shoot me an email and you say, Stu, I didn't know what it was, but I figured it out. What we're gonna do different than everybody? Because I'll tell you guys, I'm gonna kick over here. You guys all have the same shit. Coaching, community, and program is what every one of you is saying is your thing that makes me better than everybody else. It's subject so if you're a CrossFit, if you're a group class model, raise your hand if you do group, like group only is your main thing. Like you don't, individual design, personal training is not really on your service, okay, cool. When you're a group only model, you can't make that fucking statement that your programming is the best. You can't. You physically cannot tell me that 21-year-old Johnny just straight out of college playing a fucking water polo and 45-year-old Sally get the same exact amazing experience from your group program. You can't. They probably get a good workout. It's probably not the most optimal. If I look at this and say, uh, I guarantee that every individual steps in our gym, connects and feeds off our energy, making their time here the best, you're a fucking liar. You can't guarantee that. I'm sorry, you probably try with all your heart. That is not fucking true. You, cannot, you can't think of that as your niche, as your thing you're gonna do better than anyone because you can't guarantee that every individual that walks in is gonna feel that, you can't. I want us to be looking at, when we look at like some of the things that you know, we have here, not that these are wrong, I want you to dig deeper. We're gonna go a couple layers deeper today, okay? All right. So when developing your niche, which will be the main driver in marketing, everyone again, Facebook ads, pixel installation, do I go long form, do I go short form, do I go video? If it's video on Facebook, is it 90 seconds to or 60? Wait, like all these questions about how to tell your story, what fucking story would you like me to help you to tell if you can't answer these questions? These questions and figuring out your why and what you'll do make the marketing so much easier. The videos, the ideas just pop into your head. They literally pop into your head. Are your prospects looking for the best coaching community and programming? Are they? Are they walking in, walk in the front desk, say, hi, my name's Sally. Um, we just moved here, and I heard you guys have amazing coaching community and programming. I'd like to know what's on the menu. They might, you, they might, because there, there is an avatar, which I will, in another slide, we'll talk about that. There is an avatar person who is looking for that, and we'll talk about that. Do they even know what programming is? Right? When Chris isn't videotaping me running my mouth, he's a coder for Salesforce. Like if I think coding and programming, I think nerd shit. And that's me. And I still kind of think nerd shit, let alone the market. Are they looking for community or are they looking for results? Do they already expect great coaching? When I say, what's the one thing that sets you apart from everyone? Like, our coaching's awesome. I'm like, good fucking news. That's awesome. Salish Lodge, you know what they told me when I walked in? We don't got bed bugs. <laughs> no, you fucking better not. I expect that. When did we get to a point where boasting, we've got the best coaching and you get results? When did that become the fucking unique sales proposition? Duh. Why do you think so many people go to Orange Theory when everyone sitting in this room knows they could fucking coach laps maybe around that instructor or a spin instructor? Because the market doesn't place the emphasis on programming and coaching. They just figure I walk in, ah, everyone does it this, everyone's good. So again, I understand that these features, these amazing things you have and you take pride in, you spend hours every week matter. But if you go running with your flag, guys over here, the coaching, the program, it's, it's dope back here. Come on, come on, wave them in. They ain't fucking coming. They're not. Now, we'll talk about sp specific avatars. I've got two avatars that I believe in when it comes to prospects. If you've heard my stuff, I believe in a starter fitness avatar and an evolve my fitness avatar. 
When I think of the Evolve My Fitness avatar, a good buddy of mine, Mason, he owns an OPEX gym in Charlotte. When I talk to people who are at a CrossFit gym, they're burnt out, they're the group thing, it's a little over competitive or it's gotten douchey and dramatic, because that, right, that never fucking happens in a CrossFit gym. I tell them, I say, my boy Mason, he's your dude. You'll work out with people, but you'll do your own workout. It's personal training, but scalable. I send him somewhere, because I know for his avatar, he is looking for coaching and program. He's an experienced, he's an experienced member of the market. He is looking to evolve his fitness. If you guys moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, and you were CrossFitters, you'd figure out where am I gonna live, where am I gonna work out? Those would be like your two biggest ticket items. You'd probably pick where you lived based on where you wanted to work out. You, as an experienced person in the market, would be looking for coaching, community, and programming. Those would be the things I think you would probably day trade on better. But the majority of the people alive and breathing don't have your experience. Now, they might have had a personal training for six months that didn't get them a lot of results. But again, I'm just really pushing back because that's just like the, the, the vanilla, just like every fucker picked 150 as their monthly membership price back in 2009, right? Everyone was just CrossFit geographic spot, CrossFit geographic, and I was that guy too. So I want you guys just thinking a little bit different than running around and everyone, and everyone here saying our unique selling proposition is we're coaching, programming, and community, okay? Um, You'll continue to push those three in marketing and talk about them, but they cannot be your initial one. Can you not show a photo of a woman maybe in a, a arm sling? This is Tina. It's not Tina, it's Sally. Silly. This is Sally. Sally tweaked her RC playing volleyball. Three months working out at her apartment complex only made it worse. She came down, met with one of our coaches, and she is now doing blank, 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 blank service we offer, and she's back to working out one-winged, but every day she is a huge inspiration to us. When you see Sally in the gym, boom, give her a high five, but only on that right arm, the other one's fucked up. <laughs> Sally with a tweaked arm, shoulder, ankle, knee, who might see that in a Facebook timeline and say, shit, worked for her. That could be a unique, do you work with a population of injured people? My number one cancellation rate in 2013 was injury. Charlotte, North Carolina is like the mecca of I'm out of college and now I live in one of these apartment complexes which is just like a giant dorm but now I get paid a lot more. And I do intramurals. Intramural sports in Charlotte, North Carolina is fucking everywhere. I have to plan class schedules around intramural sports like championships. How you know many kids we had coming in, tweaked their ankle playing flag football? They're in seven softball leagues. The number one reason for canceling the gym back in the day, injury. I brought in a physical therapist, full time at my gym. That is my smallest, least cancellation right now. It is something we are known for. It is one of our uniques. We have a physical therapist who can do a full assessment on you. There is, short of being in a body cache, you can continue to pursue your fitness. That is a niche. That is something I can say that the other guys can't. So, start thinking about that one thing. We looked at these guys. Niches. If any of you guys know my story, I want to create WeWork meets Workout. That's my mission. That's what I'm fucking with. Um, Starbucks, great coffee, atmosphere, third place. The awesome guys over at Alchemy. Innovative fitness that works. Southwest Airlines, low fares, nothing to hide in soul cycle. Positive thinking, inward focus group exercise. These are their niches. Right? SoulCycle was the first spin studio to come out, throw candles in the room, no monitor for how fast you're going, no whatever, and it was more zen, yoga-like. Alchemy was the first group to go ahead and literally put, like if you never did, Alchemy is if yoga fucked functional fitness in the same class, right? Um, Starbucks, we all know what Starbucks did. So again, these are niches. I've said, I said it the other day on those, uh, the Australian Dudes podcast. Find me another fucking gym that's a wee work with a, with a functional fitness gym in it. I don't think it's out there. I, I, for, a time, for a period of time right now, I think I'm the only motherfucker that can say that. I'm proud of that. As long as it works out, I don't know. <laughs> I'll let you guys know in a few years. But that is a niche right now. It might not be. What if we all go back and like everybody had you know, 2,000 square foot coffee you know, lounges in their, in their gyms? It wouldn't be a niche. Niches change. The market evolves, things differ, but for right now, you have to identify what is it that actually makes you unique. 
So now that you've got that, your why and what, that's combined for that core focus, and then your core values and your core focus make your thing. You're gonna use this as a filtering mechanism, like I said earlier. Good ideas from bad ideas. Good clients from bad clients. Someone, it was on one of these affiliate owners groups, which I just love. Um, someone said, I've got a bunch of people in my gym and they don't speak English. Anyone know I should handle that? <laughs> Come again? So does anyone on your staff speak English? Nope. Maybe that wasn't the right gym for it. Maybe you'll figure it out. Maybe you'll fucking cram Rosetta Stone over the next week. I don't know. But you'll start figuring out maybe who's not a good fit for things like that. Can you service that person? Should you be servicing that person? Is that the thing you do better than anybody else? So as your things change over time, guys, analyze why it's changed, verify if it's real, accept the changes, and then begin the process if you start realizing, which I think some gyms are, they might not align with their original core focus. They may not align with their original core values. Happened to me, it could happen to anyone else, but I don't, there's other gyms. Boom, they hit it, they nailed it the first time. And they're, staying, they're staying steady and they're doing great. But if you do find out that you start really doubting why you started this thing in the first place and you wanna niche down in a different direction, you need to begin that process and have that hard conversation. Now we're just gonna create buy-in from your staff. So all this, you've had this internal conversation, you might understand it, but the people you're paying $25 an hour to do not, nor may, might not really care that much. It's a fluff piece for them. This is very clouds, and I'm a more tactical, in the dirt kind of guy. This is hard for me to sit down my, to like get excited about. I like tactical stuff. Coaches and employees like more tactical stuff, in my opinion. And it's not, it's not blanket for everybody. But if you are sitting here thinking, hey, Stu, if I went to my staff and I told them about what is our niche and why we do it, they're just gonna be like, why am I here? For, I've been getting paid for this. If you think they just roll their eyes and roll over, this 100% is on you. They believe you. They believe you. They may not believe in you. When I told my crew what I was doing to CrossFit South End, some of them did not believe me that it would work. They believed in me. They know what I've done. I have a resume, I have a history. I took you from Bank of America making this, this. I promised you I'd get you the same pay and now you have it and you, you didn't want to do that, you blah, blah. I have a track record. You guys have track record. You have employees that believe in you. So even when you throw something out there that they're like, Fuck, that ain't gonna work. But he hasn't let me stray before. That is the difference maker. So when you guys pitch this to your team, if you start getting those, I want you to understand, have faith. If you've really built in the right kind of equity in the HR sense, they will believe in you and they'll still follow, hopefully. Um, now again, I know a lot of you guys haven't given this any more real thought and you're literally in the business more than anybody else. It's you know just late at night, keeps you awake kind of scenario. With your employees and what I was just talking about on professionalizing them, showing them that you actually walk your talk and things like that, I would probably recommend if you're really deficit here, you haven't been walking your talk, your employees don't 100% buy into your shit, you're already having HR issues, Still continue to formulate this, but you have a lot of reparative processes to do before you unleash this on anybody, because once you do one of these State of the Union meetings, generally what happens, a gym owner is gonna have some realizations and they're gonna get a little bit of kickback, which is fine, we want conflict. But I highly recommend to evaluate, do your people just believe you, like, oh yeah, the photo, or do they believe in you? Do this once you truly believe they've believed in you. Maybe do it internally, still go through the steps, but this meeting, you want them believing in you. Um, so this state of, the, state of the company or state of the union address, try to get everyone in there. This is everyone, your front desk kid, your whatever, everyone top down. It just shows magnitude and gets people excited about it. The hardest thing with part-time coaches and people that are paid hourly is scheduling them all for me. Who has a hard time fucking scheduling coaches to all be same place, same time kind of scenario? Yep, I get it. Don't know what to tell you. Um, I don't have a hack for it. All I have to tell you is that's the nature of having someone who coaches four hours a week. They've got other shit going on, right? You're not their everything. Um, the state of the company meeting though, you will start past, go present, then future. Where you've been, which is history and truth, it can't be made up, it's just real simple. Hey guys, we were across the South for nine years, whatever. We started off the smallest affiliate, boom, before that we were in the park, before that it was a mobile personal training company. This is where I've taken it in nine years. That's where we've been. Where we are now. Well, we just bought this building, we're in here, we're upfitting it, we're doing these things, right? Business is still carrying on at the other facility. 
But this is where we are right now, new building. This has got to, we have a new image coming up. This is where we're going. Got this new idea, just want to run it by you guys. Whether you have a rebranding, whether you have a new building, whether you have a new, a new coach, you fired one, whether you have a new operational mode you're going through, all three of these, past, present, and future, even if you're staying the course, like, well, nothing's changing, cool. Something should be changing. There should be some kind of growth for the client, coach, or the business at some point. But this is the guts of that staff meeting. Um, I'm really like a big uh, Simon fan with Leaders Speak Last. Don't speak at these meetings except of where or where you've been, where you are now, and where you're going. Let everyone else talk. I feel a lot of times with gym owners, and I get to sit down with gym owners very, very, very frequently. We all like to talk, especially when we're in a room of people who are employees. Don't talk. Talk in the beginning, and then like a consultation or anyone who's ever taught you good sales, shut the fuck up and listen, because the people who ask questions control the conversation. It allows your team members to grow into leaders who feel comfortable sharing their opinions. Stu, that whole be daring thing. So is that why you have the half box, right? Like so we're outside the box because we're not doing CrossFit anymore? Is that, is that where, I'm not down with that. Let them talk, let them voice their shit. Don't talk over, don't tell them what you want them to ask. Always lead people into questions. Provo send a question, if they're giving you nothing from feedback, get it back. I like that it be, builds team morale and creates debate and discussion. I'm a huge fan of debates. If you watch my shit, you know that. I think converse, I tried starting arguments last night like with, with the rest of the speakers. I like arguing in the positive sense because I feel everyone's opinion is phenomenal. Like it's all, it's all good. I don't think there's bad opinions. There's nothing I can't learn from having a conversation with somebody. A lot of times I feel when we get in debates with our employees, it can become very high to low. It should be right here. Same level. Have a conversation. Don't beat them over the heads. And the best teams do choose conflict and debate. They don't choose just grabbing each other's hands and running forever. You're gonna have this. Um, here's some good questions you guys can framework and you guys will have access to all this. I'll send this to you or however Lace is gonna get this to you. But here's some good framework questions to get the conversation going, right? Make sure everyone knows they have permission to speak freely. Once everyone has had their chance to speak and comment, I want you to conclude meeting with your final thoughts. Again, you're speaking last now, right? The state of the company, it, the biggest thing with that, and again, even if the state of the company, like nothing's changing, we're just gonna talk about core values because I'm gonna be evaluating, on, evaluating you on them going forward. Nothing's changing, guys, but I wanna talk about our core focus because I feel like we've been talking about possibly installing some programs that would deviate from our core focus. So even if that's the kind of conversation you're gonna have with your staff when you go back, nothing's really changing, you're just kind of bringing and wrangling everybody in, this is still extremely, extremely valuable to have. One thing, like you're doing now, like and I look at people holding a pen and paper while I talk, that lets me know what I have to say is important. You should be doing the exact same thing. Anytime you're having a meeting with somebody, I truly believe, not digital, leave your iPad Pro on the desk, go pen and paper, take some notes. All right? Debate, discuss, don't tech. This was like at the third whiskey on the plane I made these. These are getting a little repetitive. Highlight your leadership team, stamp of approval. Yep, got that. That's my phone number. That's my email address. If you have any questions, don't call me, text me. All right? I don't know you. Um, <laughs> if anyone has any questions about this stuff and you don't get to get with me at some point during this event or you think of it when you get home, that's how you reach me. This is my full-time job. If you have any questions, hit me up. Dom, don't send me any dick pics. Um, <laughs> all right, guys. Only cool. Dom. Only Dom. Yeah, just Dom. <laughs> Everyone else is clear. Everyone else is good. Guys, if we can, let's go ahead and open this up for some q and A. I'd love to answer any questions you guys have. Boom, Carson. Dude, when you talk about coaches, uh, you want their buy-in, right? Um, yes, sir. Uh, you talk about comps, they want to care. I think a lot of times in the border members get coaches. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sure. sure. Um, I'm sure, I think some of the other conversations that'll be, or the speakers going, I'll be able to hit on that a good amount today, my guess. Compens there's two things I believe in you can day trade on with an employee. Fulfillment and compensation. Those are the only two things you can trade on with them. I believe in what I see in the micro gym industry, 
Everyone shows up with a ton of fulfillment. I hate my job as a dental assistant. I love CrossFit. Doing CrossFit as a coach, even getting paid $15 an hour, where my hourly at my other shitty job is 45, that's still a good trade. Because fulfillment's here, even though compensation's here. And you can ride that for a certain period of time. Eventually, it dwindles out. You see that in every gym owner that goes out of business. They don't actually go out of business, they fucking quit. Gyms don't go out of business. They quit. They liquidate their shit. Why? Because profit was never probably that high, but fulfillment was there every day. Fuck it, I'm broke, bay doors, God, I love that noise. Coaching class, I got that. We all know it. So I think for to have buy-in from a staff, I talk about um, discovery meetings. I believe the, t the main two questions you need to ask somebody is what is it you want to do and how much do you want to make? If literally I were to call out any one of you guys and say give me the name of your top coach, highest paid employee, I'd want to know how long they've been there and then I'd ask you, cool, what do they want to do in the next five years? How much do they want to make now? What do they want to make in three or five? Like, There's conversations and I, you know, we only have so much time here. You have to be having people, you have to know. Like I have no idea, compensation for some people. You, some of you guys have an energy exchange like coach that doesn't get paid shit, he gets a free membership, he's 42, he's retired fucking fire, you know, fighter. He loves the place. He's like employee of the year every year, he's amazing. He doesn't get paid dick. You just, you slip, tripped and fell into a lottery ticket, like a winning one. So I think compensation, it just has to be individualized. What do you want to do? How much do you want to make? And you have that conversation every three months when you evaluate them performance-wise on their core values. Thanks for kicking that off, Carson. So you mentioned a lot about HR. Like we don't, that's probably one of our biggest things. We're, we're a small gym. We kind of just went through a lot of rebranding over the last year and, and built this into this really fun environment and started into a little bit more coaching development and trying to get them the compensation that they've never really had and give them some educational opportunities. That's kind of their big thing that you were just talking about. They want education. Yeah. They want to go get, get some education. Sure. And learn how to do some of the things that we've, we've evolved over yep. to, to do some, some clients and some one-on-one -on -one teaching stuff. But, you know, I, I don't know, maybe it's just ignorance on my part. I haven't really thought about HR on, on any level besides the basic yeah, I, I mean, yeah, no, I, I understand. We all start there because we are HR in the beginning, right? That org chart is real simple. It's one little block. It has all the fucking titles in it and your name underneath. And then, but we grow it quickly out of desperation. Shit, you level one, cool, I need some part-time help because if I do another 5.30, I'm going to blow my brains out. And we, but we grow that way. We grow haphazardly and I see it happen quick. What I would tell you from an HR perspective, if you like, you're looking to just kind of, how do I kind of just kind of step foot into that realm kind of scenario and start? Yeah. I, I mean, I would, number one, I would, you know, be, you could be thinking about these things and like, what, do you have any employees that you're kind of on the fence about? That's like, he's talking about values and I don't know mine, but I know this guy definitely doesn't match. Fortunately for us, we had like a self calling when we, when we rebranded it to more yeah. specific. So like we, we want to, we, when we rebranded, we knew that normal people want to come to us. People who were told they can't. Sure. And we're telling them they can. Like you have that message, you were told you can't. Well, you can because your goal is to get back on your horse. And so, like, so uh, we lost a lot of people that were more like, I coach, but I'm working out while I coach. You sure. You have to do that. They called themselves because we weren't cool anymore. Yeah. We're not. We're not competitive. We're not teaching. We're not taking anyone to the game. Like let's. We're, so we a lot of those people just left. Like we lost a lot of coaches. We lost a few coaches that were like so. You know that you were here to coach, not do the workout. Sure. So a lot of those guys left. We assumed they were there to coach. In if we haven't hired anyone new, we're going to like maybe in the next year hire people, and and so like sometimes you whiff, right? Sometimes you're going to whiff. You thought someone was great, and then they were like, they're, you brought them home, and their beach ball yeah. was in your basement. And wants to leave. I think the biggest thing for you then it's that core values. You thought they were there, the coach. If you would have actually sat down and had the conversation, what do you want to do? How much do you want to make? By the way, these are the six things that mean more to me than anything in the world. I know you're really interested. I know you already, you know, you registered for the open nine months early. You're really excited about it. Let me ask you something. What is on your priority list right now? Hard conversations are the things we're not having. We identify labels. Level one, great. Not married and young, great. He's stereotypically, he's a good fit. He has the time and availability, he's a good fit. But you're just, it's round pegs and fucked up holes. 
And I just think, I think that conversation on the front end, like whiffing, you probably had the right intuition for what you knew superficial, like, like level. And those discovery meetings, do them off site. Never, ever take yourself home court advantage and do them in your building. I have done this for years that with the conversations I have with people off site, where it's neutral ground, where they think, fuck, is he firing me? Like taking me to Starbucks so I don't cry? That is a bet. It's seriously better than when they sit in your office, in your building, where you are king of the jungle. So go off site with those. Other questions, yeah? Uh, so, kind of on the HR question about um, core values and kind of getting that conversation started about whether or not things are lining up. Like, how do you have somebody that they do is, like you said, coaching is fine, they interact well with the members for the most part. They're more there for the monetary, which is totally fine, I get that. Um, but it's really hard. Or, like, what would, how would you approach a situation where they're. How should I say? They do a good job as coaching, they're fine, but you just personally find them really challenging just even. Their skill set matches what you need, who they are as a person, right? They teach the squat well, but they check the box of being a douchebag. Well, not so much a douchebag. Yeah. I, got, no, I get what you mean. Something less worse than a douchebag. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> On the spectrum. I got it. I got it. So you just kind of go back to the yeah. whole difficult conversation. Long term, you don't see them as a long term player in the company. Or they're just kind of a body. I, so, and a whole nother conversation. I, the one thing, if I literally had just a week with you guys, I'd probably have half you guys reallocate your payroll, get rid of all your part timers, go all in on one to two people, full timers, maybe do some energy exchanges, and that would be fucking it. All your nine fucking part time coaches you have at your gym with 200 members, get rid of them. They're sucking up payroll money that isn't, that's going to part time players. You're driving a minivan, you're in the front, you need one person shotgun telling you where the fuck to go, and you have a bunch of motherfuckers in the back saying, are we there yet? <laughs> 200 bucks a month to this guy, 400 bucks a month to that guy, $600 a month to that guy, you're not paying their bills, it's just something extra, and in fact, you're probably fucking up their tax bracket by making them claim that money. Take it away from them, give it to the people who wanna sit shotgun, read the directions, and be your fucking road dog. So when I think of Payroll, like micro gym. Again, I come from Globo Gym. I had 46 people underneath me, multiple locations. I've got gyms that have like 12 coaches, like a third of what like a Globo Gym. I'm like, what are you doing with 12 coaches in a micro gym? Micro, micro, small. So I bet you when we look at HR and people who have it, it's not I have a problem with just my these two coaches. It's generally you got a, a you got a table. There's a lot of people eating at it. But they're all leading a little bit. And they're not all that happy, and you're not all happy with them. Because I don't know if you know about this, the more friends you have, the more annoying they get. <laughs> Same thing with employees, tight groups. So I, I would also be looking at how, much, how many people do we have. Do we have a ton of people swelling up $1,200, $1,300 a month in part-time payroll that if I gave that to Coach Johnny, he'd literally shit his pants in happiness because this is all he wants to do, and he'll work 45 hours a week to be there with me in whatever compensation structure you have based on services, group, PT, ID, whatever it may be. So I, I look at that. I hope that helped. Other questions? I still have like time. I'm not sitting back down, so you guys better come up with some shit. <laughs> there we go. I have a question about the niche. About the niche, yeah. So I don't know the gym. Oh. Yes, um, I'm, I want to do some very crossfit but not crossfit. <laughs> how, how do you go about it if it's not going to be big enough? What you like, yeah, here's what you like. You like constantly varied functional movements at high intensity. That's what you're in love with. As a fitness provider, as a client, you like constantly varied functional movements at high intensity. You don't believe or agree or want to necessarily have the crossfit name tied to your thing. Sure. Start a gym where you do constantly varied functional movements at high intensity and don't have CrossFit attached to it. You don't need it. Well, that's stealing from Greg. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> no, seriously. Put the pull up and the power clean and the run and the burpee and the box jump together. Everyone's doing constantly varied functional, and we get the, we get the debate functional back and forth at high intensity. Every group fitness model is doing some element of that. Those of you guys who are like, I like the constantly varied functional movements high intensity, but I'm not really down with the certain, whatever it is about the CrossFit brand or whatever you want to get away with, then just do fucking constantly varied functional movements high intensity. No one's knocking on your door saying, you have pull-up bars and box, uh, plyo boxes back there? Yeah, sorry, that's CrossFit. We got to confiscate all that unless you have an affiliate. That's not happening. 
but you can't use the name then. You can't ride the wave of any of the publicity. Like again, there's pros and cons to that entire thing. I get that all the time. I want to open up this functional finishing, but I still want it to be CrossFit. Then don't fucking affiliate. Simple. Or you pay your affiliate fee like me. That's it. That's the, my only connection. I used to hold host certs. Recently was fired from that job. Um, but that's my only connection. I pay it. And I get a ton of shit for why I still pay it. But I just do, because I don't care. And, but I, again, if I were telling you starting off now and you truly, like I believe in functional, you know, constantly varied functional moods at high intensity, run with it. I don't think you need, I don't think you need the brand name with it. What if your niche is different? Um, we, have a, we have a lot of clubs in our area. None of the clubs. I just hear no one ever use that term. So, where are the wrestling? Got, okay, got, okay, that makes sense then, okay. So we have a lot of clubs in our area. Um, I don't know, there's like literally, I don't know, maybe 15 yep. within half an hour. The difference is our programming has been able to elevate kids from local levels, little rural towns, sure. to fucking international. Yeah. Center. We have girls that are wrestling in Japan in a couple weeks. Amazing. So, no other clubs are doing that. So our training and our programming is, is the the niche. Yes. So again, so like you know, you said we're we're in the per perfect. Uh, Eat the Frog Fitness. Who is familiar with that chain that just opened up? The guys that are trolling the fuck out of Orange Theory, and they open up. They start. They've got a Canada. They've got down here. If you look at Eat the Frog Fitness, look at the what is a paw? What's the hand of a frog? What's that called? Whatever the fucking paw of a frog is, look at it. Tell me it is not the logo for Orange Theory. The five that tell me it's not. Just go look it up sometime. But Eat the Frog Fitness is exactly Orange Theory, except it's green, but they have an Olympic, whatever the fuck, athlete who created an Olympic program for people who want Olympic athlete results. That becomes their niche. What is Orange Theory's niche? They're constantly varied functional movements at high intensity. The fuck are they doing so special? They were the first ones to come out and say, hey, we do heart rate, and there's this burn effect 36 hours afterwards, and they slap some pseudoscience or whatever. That's what, that was their niche. Tech. They were the first ones to come out with tech, and, and like really come out with tech, and it wasn't even new tech. It's the same shit I did in lab in fucking you know, high school. For you, it's not your programming. It's what you've produced. Mm -hmm. It is what you've produced. If you literally don't have giant fucking things like this with all those little wrestling people kids pictures, he did this and he won that. Oh, that guy, he did this and he did what everyone, when someone walks into your space, what do you do? Well, we make wrestlers better at wrestling. Cool, there's 15 other clubs that do that. Yeah, but did they got these fuckers to boast about? That's your niche. That's your niche. Your work, your actual resume. Our clients are our life's work. They will be the things like that will be your niche, in my opinion. What you've actually produced. I'm still here. <laughs> Anything. Cool. We can give them extra time for bathroom or something like that, or do you want me to rock this out? Or? Oh. So, uh, obviously, the, the why and, the, and all that kind of stuff is like, it seems like everybody comes back to the work community. Yep. What is your opinion on, like, like, why is it such a big fucking deal to say community? Like, in a good or a bad way? In, like, in, in, a, in any kind any of way? Yeah, like, I mean, again, like, I think it's just something that uh, within the community aspect and or some people still kind of get to the point, like, well, I don't want to, I want to do CrossFit, I don't want to call it CrossFit. Well, yeah. Like, that's your own thing. Yeah. Right? Like, that's on you. Yep. Don't blame CrossFit or don't blame the people down the street. But as yeah. far as the community aspect. I think community for CrossFit gets difficult because it's worldwide. It's not only a fitness methodology, but it's a global sport. I think so. Community gets, gets tough. Community is something that does not procure the interest of our members, meaning initially incite them to come in. It's what keeps them around. It retains our members. Friendships and relationships. And the other guys in here, we talked a ton last night about how this is the relationships we have with everyone is the only thing that's going to keep Aptiv, which is if you guys follow like the fucking, the Alexa AirPod version of personal training and things like the mirror. If you guys follow that, it's a giant fucking mirror where you literally work out in front of an entire class and do burpees with the class. It's, again, before the robots take you all out at your businesses, mine included, the one thing that's to be our saving grace, people, relationships. I'm not against the word community. I just truly know, and I believe this solely, and I'll argue this to the death, very few of the prospects coming in are looking for community, so I don't think you need to make that like your niche, but the ones that are, 
won't ask you for it. The people looking for community will be like, hey, how's that community, Joe? And he's going to be like, well, it's awesome. They're going to go and test it out. Like someone who's looking for a place to belong will step in and take a test ride and figure out whether it's right for them. So my thing with community, all for it, love it, use it. It's, it's retain, I think it's just more of a retention thing. It's a stickiness thing, a tribal thing, than it is that initial join our tribe. Now, there's a little bit of that out there. Again, I think it changed with the avatar starter fitness versus evolve, but that, those are my thoughts on community. I have a question kind of relates to that. Um, so when a prospect joins, they're not looking for coaching, programming, community. I get that. Members that have been there for, say, over a year, there's a switch that happens, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, 100%. You're, up and you're like, I want yep. belt, I want this weight, I want yep. But a year in, you're like, these are my people. Sure. You. So something we've ran into that it's a problem, but it's a good problem, whatever. We're highly, highly referral driven. Sure. How do you help cast vision for members that now, like people that love our gym, when they recruit their friend, they're like, oh, we have the best coaches. They like know everybody. Our programming is awesome. Like, dude, no one gives a fuck about that. Like, this one was so you're like, how do I craft the marketing message being delivered through oral referral through your members yeah now don't that that's worked forever the reason you've had success with it I wouldn't try to mess with that at all let them say those things I do think there's some education you guys can do with members like I have a very we have a unique way of people getting started at my gym and that was new in the rebranding and I had to educate members that this is the new way people come in here and they're introduced like repeatedly and that wasn't just like mentioning after class I'm talking text message blast to my app that we have I'm talking on the website, I'm talking in email, like and it took months, it's still taking, I mean, it's not finished. So I think there has to be a level of education as to letting people know, hey, no, yeah, so you're thinking of bringing in Sally from work? Awesome, cool, like, whatever. Let her know, though, that when she comes in, she, we're not gonna throw her right in the group, we're actually gonna sit down and she's gonna meet with a coach for a consultation, and she'll be starting with one-on-one -on -one coaching instead, because we know how intimidating this is, and you've been telling her all this good shit about us for six years, and she hasn't come yet, because she's intimidated, let her know, our individual tailored approach to coming in here, that's gonna be like, it's gonna change her view of this whole thing. I don't think you try to, don't, just let them keep doing what they're doing. Arm them with some new vernacular. I think Jim's gonna nail this. I think, I don't know, he's talking about educating you guys on some of this stuff. I think uh, the vernacular that you guys utilize to educate the members on how to get started, so huge. They're, part, they're like, they're like, Non-energy, they're like midi, they're like me mavens for your your brand. They can't if literally none of your clients can repeat how to get started. Yeah, find me someone who went to Chipotle. Hey, where do I go? You stand right there. Simple. They know exactly where to tell me to go. What do they serve? Burritos, tacos, bowls. Like so, when that's confused and your your clients can't even repeat how someone gets started and begins that process, I think it just takes education from the business to them. So. Um in talking about relationship building, we have a couple of our coaches who also have a role as membership outreach coordinator. So they keep tabs on members. Where you been, you haven't been, in, that kind of thing, yeah. And um, they kind of see them through various tests and retests and all that. But from a scalability standpoint, like we're sitting comfortably with 100 members. Sure. How do we maintain those kinds of relationships as we? So one of the compensation models I think is really good, and there's other uh, groups that advocate that, is coaches being, and with trying to be as general about this as possible, coaches being assigned or whatever, being assigned to a pool of clients. That is their pool of clients. There's uh, KPIs attached to that whole thing, and that's how you scale it, right? Like, and again, I generally find around 80 or so, maybe 90-ish, like, you know, depending on what your model is, that can kind of be a threshold for some people, depending on whether it's just customer service or it's individual design programming or whatever. I think you, that's, that's part of the role. That's part of someone who works in your business full time. Their compensation, their success in your business should also be tied to that churn or the success of the business with people coming, going, that kind of thing. So that, I'd be like, yeah, one person is not going to scale that out. There's no like magical Scipio application or like CRM that's going to allow, you know, fucking Tina at the desk to just cast the web over 300 people. It's, it's, a, it's a people business. Cool. Lace, we good? Yeah, you guys good? Any last questions? Let's thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys.
Too many thoughts on my mind, I can't sleep at night, so I just keep writing I don't need no help, I don't need opinions, so don't waste my time then I just been living online, my city don't show me no love and that's fine Fuck local radio stations, I got more plays than all of these rappers combined I'm going, I'm going again, I've been going in, I'm fed up with so many things I gotta just let it all out, I'm talking about the shit they've been talking about Telling me I should do this, telling me I should do that Telling me, telling me things about rap, talking the truth and that stabbing my back They will knock me off track, no, no, too many things have been built